welcome. I wish I could embrace you and welcome you to Atlanta properly, but it's just so good to see your face again. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I know. I wish that's how we can do it, but let's do that. Let's make sure we do that soon, as soon as we can, please. Absolutely. Now, I'm curious about environment always, so tell me about the little crescent moons that I see behind your head. Yeah, I was talking about these the other day. I just walked into Urban Outfitters and liked them, but I do love moons. I just thought, and it makes a really pretty sound, like when the wind comes through, it's just a very gentle, pretty thing. This is my bedroom. You and I have talked so often about how I have my little setup here back in my bedroom, so. I was telling my book club friends over the weekend how you write your novels in bed, and they didn't believe me. They were like, wow, that's not possible. You can't be pretty. I'm like, she's written bestsellers in her bed. And do you know Raven Lalani has the same habit? Does she? I think that you and I talked about that. Yeah, yeah. So see, that's yeah. that's really great company to be in. I'm not going to complain about that. Even though I did tell you that I do have a table now. I do have a new table. And sometimes I do write at the table of the couch. But but when I have to, because, you know, when my little, when I was writing and my, my babies were so small, it was the only spot in the house I could come and close both the doors and actually be back here so that mommy could get it done. Especially when I'm towards the end of a book when I need to be like alone. So it just became my spot for me but like you one day you had tried it you were like I tried it my back hurt I quit <laughs> that's what I would think Lisa I love that you self-describe as a homemaker on your website along with all of your other accomplishments um does it feel like that role has been is devalued in contemporary culture and why is it important for you to claim that when I wrote my bio initially uh, you know for things when I was submitting things it was about I want to say was like 10 or 11 years ago. And so that was really my primary role. I wasn't even ready. If someone had offered me some huge contract for a book thing, I wouldn't have known what to do because my babies were just so small and my whole world was just homemaking really. I left it in there because it just felt like it was my job. And I didn't really think I was a real writer when I first wrote it. So I kind of keep it in there for me. Um, there's something, I just feel like there's a little bit of charm to it that, that now, especially because I do have more books that it says first that I'm a homemaker. I mean, I just think it's a little joke I have with, <laughs> with myself, but yeah, I mean, of course I do think it's pretty like old fashioned and sweet, but that was definitely my job. You know, I got my degree in English and I worked at the newspaper for a year and then I had babies and that was, I mean, it was my job. My entire job was just homemaking and take care of my kids all day until they were in school. And so it's just kind of like an inside joke I have with myself. Yeah. Well, I've met your children and well done, mama. You do the job. <laughs> Thank Congratulations you. on your latest birth. This <laughs> yes. What is it about for anyone in the audience who has not had the chance to read it yet? Yeah, so quickly, um, This Close to OK is a story about a life-changing weekend between two strangers. We have a woman named Tally Clark who's on her way home from work. And um, as she's driving across a bridge, she sees a man who's standing as if he's going to jump. So immediately she stops and, um, and screams to him, hey, and stops, and, and stops him and does not want him to jump. Um, she is a therapist, so she is really trained in talking to people who are having the worst days, but also she doesn't want to tell him that in case he has an aversion to talk therapy. So she does gently, she plays music for him. She tries to connect with him. She tells him, um, she blurts out that she's had really bad days too, and she's recently gone through a divorce. She cannot have children, but her husband got his mistress preg pregnant. And so she sort of blurts all this out and then invites him for a cup of coffee, then eventually invites him back to our house. And so this, the book takes place over the entire weekend. It's a rainy Halloween weekend in Kentucky. You get um, both their points of view. You get to hear from him too. When they get back to her house, he tells her that his name is Emmett. And then um, she knows that opening up can help other people open up. But as she opens up to him, he's kind of like, whoa, you have a lot of stuff going on too. <laughs> and so through the course of the weekend, they actually um, end up spilling their secrets to each other and he you know trying their best to heal each other when tally first sees emmett on that bridge and she's yelling hey hey one of the first things she says is i see you and lisa that reminded me of something i read several years ago about suicides off of the san off of the golden gate bridge in san francisco and a gentleman who works in i don't know if it was public works but he talked about one young man who jumped to his death and he had written a note 
saying, if anyone stops me and just smiles at me as I'm about to, you know, go over the bridge or just says hello or just sees me, I will not go through with this. So we know that this, I think that bridge is three miles long. Yeah. We know this young man walked for a mile and a half and no one looked at him. No one saw him. No one acknowledged him. I think very visually when I think of you and I think of, I think of you as a dandelion puff. And I think <laughs> of little spores as ideas that come to you. And I'm wondering how this oh. news came to you wanting to tell the story about just, I see you and what that can lead to. Yeah, wow, oh, that's too sweet. I don't know what to do with that. I'm gonna hold that. Thank you, Miss Gail. Yeah, I, um, I always, my books always start from one image and that was the image. That really was the image, the image of a man standing there in the rain and the person who would stop and talk to him. So I wrote a note in my phone six years ago that said man stands on the edge of the bridge woman convinces him not to jump and takes him home and then you know six years later it's a book but there's a lot in between I really I'm one of those people um you know when I go to a bigger city I've seen people on the train or crying on public transportation um it, this happened to me once in Chicago and a woman she was just really really crying and, and you know Louisville is a you know it's, it's an it, it's not a wildly urban environment. I mean, it is, but we don't have like, a, I don't spend a lot of time on public transportation here. I live in the suburbs, almost to the country. And so, so it is kind of a strange thing for me to be on public transportation. I don't take it a lot. And I remember she was, I did eventually, so this was Chicago. I'm from Kentucky, but I did eventually ask her if she was okay. Um, and, and she said, yeah, you know, I wanted to give her a tissue and ask if she was okay. And I didn't really think about how, oh, if you don't do this here, when you're in New York, like, oh, people just ignore people, but I just can't do it. I just can't do it. And so I was thinking about Tally and especially, you know, because she made it, she makes it her life's work to talk to people and to listen to people. Um, so even if people weren't paying attention or even if people saw him and was like, oh, someone else to take care of it. She's just not that person. She really would over overly to even if the person wanted to be left alone, she's not going to leave him alone. <laughs> she's going to ask questions. She's going to she's going to want to make sure he's OK. And she that's what she says to him early in the book. I'm not going to just leave you here. Like even if you he's like, leave me alone. And she's like, no, <laughs> you know, because that's the person that's the person she is. And so I, I knew that from there, a lot of times, well, pretty much every time I'm writing a story or a book, I'm telling the story to myself first. And so I wanted to know what happened to them. And it became a book. What did you want to say about how urgency can force intimacy? Because Tally really gets into, and I think they call it big talk. Uh, you know, right. There's no, there's no fluff. There's no, um, there's, it's all lean, no fat. What did you right. want to say about that? Right. Well, I was thinking about this the other day when I had another event because I was telling the law, I was telling a story quickly about my husband saving a little boy from choking. Um, we, we were sitting outside and the little boy was choking and, then my, you know, the, the mom was like, please, can someone help? And my husband went over immediately because he's really trained in that stuff. And he went over and the boy spit it out and like could breathe again. And the mom just immediately wrapped her hand, you know, wrapped her arms around my husband and it, all that is gone. With, you know, you know. 20 seconds earlier, we didn't know each other. We, we wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't not have spoken if this horrible thing hadn't happened. But I was thinking about that. And I think about that often, especially, you know, if there's a tornado or some sort of car accident or something, oh, that that's gone. You know, it's just, now we're intimate. Now we're going to be friends. We were going to hug. We're going to, we've had this shared experience together. We're going to share these things together. And so, you know, especially, especially because Tally is trained being a therapist, there is, she realizes that this man's just about to take his life. He probably doesn't just want to talk about whether he likes coffee or what kind of donuts he likes. And he cuts that real quick. He's like, I'm not really interested in that because everything would be reframed for both of them really at that point. So she starts there and he's like, yeah, I, I don't want to do that. And then she respects that. And then, you know, she starts sharing her own stuff to get deeper than just the shallow stuff. You know, it's interesting because even though Tally is a trained therapist, I never felt that she was talking from her head. It was never an intellectual exercise, but a heart exercise. But now right. that I'm thinking of it, you can't do that recklessly. So there, it has right. to be a combination of head and heart. How did you learn to do that, Lisa? Because it's right. incredible to me. Like if I want to, I want to be with Tally. 
<laughs> yeah, I really, well, thank you. It's a high compliment. I, you know, I, I just wanted her to, to be herself and to be vulnerable at any other point in her life. Maybe she would not be saying those things would not be feeling those things, but she's had a really rough year too. And she's a little bit broken. She's tired. It's late. Um, you know, life can just be really exhausting. So they both, they are meeting at these points where they're both just really tired and broken. Can we just be quiet together? Can we just make dinner? Like, you know, without it. So I think that that helped a lot in order for me to let her do that. Also, when it comes to head and heart, I really wanted her to be a real person. She is not perfect. She does lots of things that people might be like, oh, should she do that? But that's the way that we are as humans. Really great people do some weird stuff and really weird bad people can do something that's really great too you know so I really I try to have my characters be as honest as they can and I try to make them as real as they can be when it comes to those things even if it's a little confusing sometimes I was never confused but I was terrified for Tally you're bringing this man home <laughs> you don't know who he is you don't know what's in that backpack and only because I know you and you you love soft places so I trusted you to not land me in some place where I was going to chew my fingernails down <laughs> and need therapy. So th I thank you for that. Um, did you find that writing, the book is written from two points of view, Emmett's and Tally's. Did one voice come to you more easily? Did one voice come to you with more revelations? Are you more proud of one voice than the other? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. When I'm starting out, I'll do this I'll do this thing when I'm writing from different points of view and I'll actually keep track of the page numbers to see how weighted it is, like to see how naturally, if I'm leaning towards one or the other, and then I'll try to even that out as much as I can. I mean, we've started, so Whiskey and Ribbons, my first novel is written from three points of view. Um, but, you know, the one I start with is the, you know, I, I start with one for a reason, you know. Um, I usually start with my girls, um, especially if there's a male character. I usually start with my girls most often, you know, but um, with, with both of them, I get really excited when it's time to, time to switch to the next voice. So as a writer and as a reader, and I try to keep really close track of how long the chapters are and that, that kind of stuff when it comes to writing. Oh, it's time to hear from the other one now. Or I, I wanna, a lot of times I wanna uh, you know, set a scene and make sure that we get the scene in a different way from the other character. One character might think something so great and the other character was like, that made me feel kind of weird. Or one character may feel very comfortable in a situation and one character, the other one may feel overstimulated in the situation. And so I try to get both sides of it so that we can get to the truth. And then through the process of that, I always just end up falling in love with whoever I'm writing at the time, no matter what, you know, and even, like, so she has an ex-husband who at the beginning, I'm telling the reader, you know, she's telling the reader, he's a jerk. He does all this stuff. He's got this weird ponytail. But then even through the course of writing about Joel, I fell in love with Joel. You know, he did a terrible thing. Did you see? And I've heard that. I love that. Yeah. I felt that he was human against all odds. I really felt empathy for him. And yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to create any spoilers. So that's all I'm <laughs> going to say about Mr. Joel. <laughs> but I, I mean, really, thanks for saying that. Cause I felt the same way too. Cause when I first started, I was like, Oh, girls, he's the worst person. And then I was like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Everyone can do a terrible thing. And we, we don't, we shouldn't be defined by the worst thing we've done. And, and can we forgive each other? Can we forgive one another? If we've, if we've really, really loved each other at one point and still do like, what does that mean? And that's what he says in there. He's like, where, where does it go? I, where would it go? So exactly. All right. Well, I know that readers will love to hear a little taste of this is this close to okay in your voice. So would you read a passage that's especially dear to you? I would love to. They were en route to her place. He'd been quiet so far in the car, only replying to the question she asked. So you have a house or an apartment? I used to. Not anymore, really, he said. You don't have anywhere to stay? I didn't say that. I just don't have a house or an apartment. You have a car? I don't have a car here, not in town, he said. How do you get around? I get around all right, he said. He looked over at her with the backpack in his lap. He kept his hand on top of it. Tally's fear scuttled back when she glanced at that backpack. That's where his torture devices could be. The ropes, the gun, the knives, knives out. Creepy song to be floating across the coffee shop. 
Tally kept hearing the chorus in her head. It was full dark and still raining, although not as much as before. Halloween was on Saturday. What was she doing? Locked in her car, the stranger in her passenger seat, driving him to her house? This was a perfect horror film she had created. And when they got to her place, he'd take whatever it was out of that backpack, murder her, and put her somewhere no one would ever find her. Her parents and brother would be on TV begging for her return. Years from now, her brother would write a book about it. It'd be a bestseller, get optioned for a movie. One of those kids from one of those teen vampire shows would play Bridge. He'd win an Oscar. Her brother would become a highly sought after screenwriter and leave his family, start dating one of the young girls from the same teen vampire show. And all of that should have kept her from taking Bridge to her house, but none of it did. She never did things like this. And she was leaning into that chaotic energy, eager to see what was waiting for her on the other side. The wide mouth of the world was opening up. Something was happening, something beyond her control. She'd been given the keys to the lion's cage and she was inside penning it, staring into its pale amber eyes. When Tally's house was built, the Fox Commons neighborhood was brand new, a mixed use community unlike anything else in Louisville. Most residents swapped their expensive cars for golf carts when they got home from work and used them to motor their children to the school playground or the walking trails at sunset, the fountain in the square, the amphitheater overlooking the fishing lake. There was a public pool, several tennis courts, two salons, and a building solely devoted to doctor's offices, dermatologists, neurologists, allergists, pediatricians, internal medicine, plastic surgery. Residents had their choice of fine dining with plenty of outside seating, including Tally's favorite Trattoria, Thai noodles, sushi, pizza, and an American bistro with the best burgers in town. There was also a pastel sweet shop where the gelato was made with local milk and an Irish pub lit up with enough lime green bulbs to turn everyone into Alphaba from Wicket upon entering. Plans for two hotels, one Leviathan, one boutique had been drawn up. The grand opening ribbon for six neat beige rows of condominiums had recently been cut with a pair of comically large scissors. Lionel was an investor and he and his wife Zora had attended the ceremony, then stopped by Tally's for small batch bourbon and homemade Kentucky jam cake afterward. The steps leading to Tally's white brick front porch were fringed with pumpkins, some orange, a few blued like skim milk. A fluffy wreath of orange, red, yellow, brown leaves hung on the wide yellow front door. On one wicker porch chair, there was a polka dotted canvas pillow with the word hocus printed on it. On the other, pocus. The welcome mat read hello in loopy black cursive on the stiff hay colored brush. Um, I can make dinner. Are you hungry? She asked after they'd gotten inside. Her house was immaculate because the night before she dusted, swept the floors, beat the rugs outside. Was it her hormones, perimenopause? She felt like nesting and had decided to bring Bridge home like he was one of her rescue cats. Usually her two cats were skittish around new people, but they were curious about Bridge and sauntered around the living room with their tails up and hooked. The marmalade one is Jim and the black one is Pam, she said. Like from the office, exactly. In their short amount of time together, they'd already gotten in the habit of ping-ponging their questions and answers. She'd ask him a question and he'd ignore it completely, only to answer three questions later, both of them remembering where they left off. He was easy to like. He put his backpack at his feet and taken his jacket off. Tally took it from him, hung it on the hook in the laundry room so it could drip. I could help cook. I'll eat, he said, sitting on the couch. Great. Okay, that's what we'll do. She went to her bedroom and returned with some dry clothes. You can put these on, she said, handing them to him. And I'll go to the bedroom and change too. Then we'll make dinner. We should tell listeners that Bridge is Emmett's name before right. he reveals his identity to Tally. Yes. <laughs> and the other thing that I want to say about your novels is that you're really good at setting up stormy interiors, whether it's a, a character's interiority or a stormy backdrop. The night mm. that Tally meets, meets Bridge or Emmett, he's standing on a bridge and it's, it's raining sideways. It's yeah. raining and that goes on throughout the, throughout the weekend. Why is it, why is cozy important to you? So why are safe spaces important to you? Yeah, you know, I've just, I just feel like it's a huge part of my survival in this world because the world is so dark and scary and sharp. And so I just can't control anyone else. I can't control the weather. I can't control situations or the news or politics or the world or anything in it, but I can control 
a tiny little part of my world and get something soft and something that smells good. And I can close my door and I can open the window so I can hear the birds and I can make a pot of tea and just try to keep on being a human in this world. And so I hang on to that as if it's, you know, it's like, it's so important to me. I fight really hard for it. Um, so even if I do have to go out and do something scary or something I don't want to do, or the world gets really loud and traffic, and I'm so e- I'm really easily startled. I'm really easily overstimulated and I can't control those things when I'm out, but I can come home. And so what I do that in my books, when I have someone going through something really horrible or a lot of horrible things, more than one thing, I want to make sure that I am giving them a nest, giving them a comfortable space. I um, also want the reader to feel safe and comfortable, not completely, not so nothing surprising will happen because a lot of surprising things happen in my book, but just because the whole idea of curling up with the book is so appealing to me. Yeah. And I do it to my characters too, because I know I'm going to hurt their feelings and put them through a whole lot of stuff. So I want to make sure that they have somewhere safe to be or land if that's what's going to happen for them. Did you watch the inauguration last month? I did. When I saw Amanda Gorman, I'll read the yeah. last few lines of her poem. I thought, this is a little baby Lisa Cross. She said, as we all know, oh, now, oh. the new dawn balloons as we free it, for there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. That, that's, that's exactly what your writing is. It's all about seeking light. What did you think when you heard her saying those words? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, that's my sister right there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And so many people, obviously so many people all over the world felt that too. And what a perfect time to hear that. And I, it's, it's the sort of thing too, that I think someone could sort of write off like, oh, oh yeah, yeah. That sounds really good. But I'm like, no, listen, listen, like really listen. And what if everyone really listened and did that? It would literally change the world. Do you have a recollection yeah. of learning that lesson of being in an environment where you just had an overwhelming sense of well-being and then dawned on you that somebody was intentional about creating this space that would make me feel so safe, would make me feel so cozy? Do you remember the first time that happened to you and then understanding that you could replicate that in your own life? Yes, in small instances that ended up big, I would just think of when I was little and just needed that love and comfort that my mom would do really tiny things like that for me. So like, you know, when I was sick, I know my, if I had a sore throat, my mom would crush ice by hand and put it in this little green plastic bowl. And then if I stayed home from school, she would make the couch up like a bed so I could watch Prices Right and be there. So it was something, <laughs> yeah, because that's what I was doing but it's like, it, it's funny because it, it's just something small that's a little bit different, but someone going out of their way to be like, it's different today. You don't feel good. What can we have? What can we have special? And when I was a little girl, I, you know, of course I was, uh, was just so in love with books. And so I, I, my bedroom wasn't good enough for me. I actually made a spot behind my bed where I put extra pillows, a fan, and I would climb back behind my bed because it was sort of made a triangle against the wall. And I would go even further in to read my book. So like my bed wasn't good enough. I had to tuck into like a little cave so I couldn't be disturbed at all. And so I've just always... I'm always looking for that. Like I'm on, that's why I put cozy advocate into my bio now, because I just, am always promoting it. I'm like a, always trying to convert people <laughs> into, <laughs> into making their lives as cozy as possible. <laughs> this close up to, okay. Not only comes with beautiful words, but a playlist curated by you. Tell me how music informs either your writing or your thought process, or is it something that comes after the fact? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I never listen to music when I'm writing. I can't listen to music with words. So I can listen to instrumental music and I'll listen to classical music a lot. Um, but what, what, one important song that I put into the book is Bring It On Home To Me by Sam Cooke. So they're, you know, they're in the car, they go out for lunch and they're in the car and, you know, they don't know very much about each other, but she's like, okay, stop me when we, you know, stop me when you hear a song you like. And so as they flick through, bring it on home to me, Beth, Sam Cook comes on. He's like, stop. And she's like, I know, right. I'm going to stop. You know, everyone loves that song. I can't imagine not loving that song. And so, so that was an example of me using a song like that, that you would hear. It's kind of like, 
you know, it's like if you're at the grocery store and someone's humming along to a song, you'd be like, this is a good song, right? Everybody loves this song. <laughs> um, and so I, I, sometimes I'll just do that and give something really simple. It's just very basic way to connect um, to another person, whether you know the person or not. Um, something that they can understand, something that they can talk about. And then, yeah, it always creeps into my books. Um, a lot of times if people are just having a conversation, so they're just having a conversation, she just wants to get to know him. What are the music that you like? And then people will start to to argue about that. Oh, you like them? No, I don't like them. They're so much better. And it's just kind of an easy way to start out. Um, and then when they're on the bridge, she pulls out her phone and just starts playing a song for him. Um, just as a distraction, like, oh, what do you think about this? Hey, look, look over here. Almost the same way a mom does with a, a child to try to distract them. Like, oh, look at this. Look what mommy has. That's what she's trying to do. Oh, do you like this song? What kind of songs do you like? Just anything to keep him from jumping. And so a lot of times I'll just use them for fun. A lot of times it'll be like a point to try to get to know a character. Um, I, 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 I'm usually, before I start writing and during, you know, during the process of writing, I put thousands and thousands of songs on a playlist. So by the time I give it to the reader, I've whittled it down to 10 or 15, but this close to okay, I, I, I do think I have about 1500 songs on the playlist. And then I, I kind of package the most important ones and turn them over to the reader. Another way that Tally and Emmett bond over beauty is when they talk about art, visual art. Yeah. Do you have a thing from Michelangelo's David or is that just Tally's thing? This is when I should keep it a secret and not tell you, right? Because you texted me about that. And I was like, oh, no, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah the, I, I will confess that is a thing. That is a thing that I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa. It's perfect. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. I mean, I love David from the Bible anyway. He's one of my favorites and because he was just so, so flawed and just so completely messed up sometimes. And I love that the Lord says he was a man after the Lord's heart. And so I, I just, it just gives me hope as a person, as a human now that we can be completely flawed and messed up and that God is just crazy about us and sees that we're crazy about him. So as a believer, I just love David and the story of David. You know, there's so much in there to unpack and talk about. Um, but yeah, it's just simple. I just love art. I love sculpture. I'm fascinated by it because I cannot do a thing. I cannot draw. I can barely draw a smiley face. Like my kids roast me all the time. I am terrible at drawing things. I could not make a sculpture to save my life. So I just love this amazing talent that other people have to do these things. And I just think that David is perfect, just beautiful. I, I mean, every time I look at it, it's like I see something new. I just love it. I have not seen it in person. And, and so I talk in the book about how she's, she's afraid that she, she's going to like have a panic attack or these art attacks. And I feel the same way. Like I'm pretty nervous to see it in person, but I also can't wait. It's just one of those things I can't really explain. I just love it. You don't have to, Lisa, because you are doing what sculptors, what painters, what visual artists do. You are, you just, you're, you're doing it in a different idiom. You're rendering something from your imagination. You're weaving yeah. a story out of nothingness, out of, like I say, the little dandelion puffs and the spores that come down to you from who knows where. So you are your own kind of alchemist. That's how I see it. Now, I find it fascinating that your first job out of college was writing obituaries. Yeah. And I wonder how that may have informed your understanding of suicide, of people who are grieving, of death, of loss. And you were so young when you were doing that. So tell me what that experience was like. Yeah, I mean, it was at times really intense. I was at one point seven months pregnant writing obituaries on Christmas. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to remember this because the newspaper, the news does not stop. So we know holidays where we, we didn't get holidays off. I, I, I really, you know, I've always been really tuned into my own mortality. My dad is a preacher, a Southern Baptist preacher. And if you've ever heard a Southern Baptist preacher, they preach about death a lot, eternity a lot. And so I've always grown up under that umbrella. I was never one of those people who thought oh, I was too young to die or too whatever. I've just never been one of those people. And so I've always been tuned to it. Um, I usually write characters who are tuned into it too, and just want to make the most of their lives when they can, because they realize that anything could happen, you know, 
at any moment. Working in obituaries, um, it, it was, I, I really did enjoy the job. When I, when I got it, I really felt like I was putting my English degree to use. So I got an English degree. What am I supposed to do with that? I didn't want to teach. Um, but I wanted to do something with my English degree. And so just old timey, I'm like, I'll get a job at the newspaper. And I loved that I got a job at the newspaper, no matter what it was really. But yeah, this job specifically writing obituaries. But yeah, I mean, a lot of times when people came down to um, place memorials for loved ones who have passed away. So you just take a legal pad down. Well, I'm sure you could take your phone now. This was a long time ago, so I'm aging myself. But we would take a legal pad downstairs and talk to the person. If the person, you know, whatever they wanted to say, you know, in the sometimes the people would cry. We'd get people on the phone and 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 talk to people, you know, and when they've just, you know, it's really fresh. They've just lost a loved one. Um and so when I was very pregnant, my coworkers were really nice because if you, if you're, if you're fortunate enough to not work in a hospital or a funeral home and haven't experienced it, a lot of people don't know how many babies die. And so I know when I was very pregnant, um, my coworkers would take all the babies off my desk. So we would just get a desk and so they would make sure that I didn't see how many babies were dying. They did small, sweet stuff like that for me. And once while I was working in the obituary department, a, a girlfriend in our circle of friends was killed in a car accident and her obituary was on my debt. She was actually the first phone call I got in the morning. And so things like that just happen in a, you know, in a city like this, when you know a lot of people and um, yeah, once you know how many people die all day, every day, it does. If you work in the funeral industry or in, in obituaries in any way, it, it definitely changes how you see the world, for sure. And it expresses what you wind up writing about, this sense of urgency forcing intimacy. What can be yeah. more than speaking to someone whose beloved partner or child or parent has just passed away? What do you think the editor saw in you that said, let me put this young, young, young woman on obituaries? He must have, <laughs> she must have, it's very sexist of me, detected a level of sex <laughs> or a maturity or a wisdom in you, I would think. You know, you know, I'm, I'm really not sure. I mean, it could have been right place, right time. And the fact that, um, you know, I had to take typing in high school and so I can type really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I did fit in with the team, you know, and my boss was really great and we had a great little team and we called ourselves the, you know, like an island of misfits because it, oh, you know, technically obituaries is in the sales department, but obviously it's so different. And so we had this little room off from the sales department and we were just different because it's very different. We're not selling an oven. We're actually talking to people who've just lost people. So we were just weird little rebels. And I, I really did love it. I worked there up until a week before I had my first, you know, my first baby, but I did love it. And I feel like it really helped me. And when people ask me about it, I love to brag that it was the easiest part of writing whiskey and ribbons this is not a spoiler if anyone hasn't read it because um, my character is killed in the first sentence but um i writing his obituary it was the easiest part of any book i've ever written wow that is so <laughs> all right i see questions coming in and i do not want to take you up all to myself so let's see um, i want to remind viewers to please send me your questions um, and to purchase the book through Acapella Books, our beloved Frank Reese is right here and would appreciate the business. All right, is this a question? For Tally being an open book, I was a little surprised. Tally kept her profession hidden. Was there ever a thought in the writing process to have her be honest about her job? So Tally is a therapist, but that doesn't come out until- Right, right. Perspective. It's kind of too late. Um. I always knew she was going to keep that a secret. And the reason why is sort of complicated, but I'll try to make it, I'll, I'll try to make it easy. I really wanted to sell this book. <laughs> also, I really wanted to sell this book and the idea for this book. And I knew in order to do that, I was going to have to keep some stuff in my pocket um, as a writer. Um, and I wanted to keep things from the reader. Um, so telling the reader that, but I know the reader's going to hang on to want to see when that's going to come out. And also the reader wants to know what Emmett was doing there and, and, and how he got 
and how he got there and how she's going to find that out. And so I really was just adding as much as I could to the mystery. So that really is, that really is the quickest answer why I decided to do that. And I just thought that it was interesting. It is interesting because she is an open person. Why would she keep that? Oh, you know, because he started talking. I don't want him to shut down. Now I don't want to tell him. And so it just was interesting for me to see how that was going to come out. But yeah, I wanted to sell the book and I knew that readers would want to know when that was going to come out too. Well, how realistic is, is it for a therapist? Do people really climb up around therapists? I would think it's like saying I'm an orthopedist and people say, oh, doc, can you take a look at my frozen shoulder? You know, yeah. so wouldn't Tally having acknowledged I'm a therapist make Emmett think A, maybe it's a sign from God that I'm not supposed to leap or B, wow, what good luck. A therapist comes by just when I need her. Yeah, I, th I think for some characters, but not for Emmett. And so through the course of reading the book, I, I think it makes sense why he wouldn't want to open up to that. Also, he's a man and I'm not trying to be stereotypical, but I just know the men in my life. No, they would. Uh, no, it seems like some sort of trick. No, 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 no. Don't try to use your little, you know, your little magic. I mean, if she had met a woman like her on that bridge, absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. Or even, even just someone who was more open to it. But the, at that point I knew only because I'm writing him that he would not have been open to that. He just would have felt like it was a trick and no thanks lady. So no, I totally get what you're saying. Absolutely. We have the same men in our lives, Lisa. We love them. <laughs> Not open books. All right. Do no. you prefer writing short stories or novels? I would say that it depends. If if I if I want to just feel the experience of writing something and writing something new and something I could finish quickly, I love writing a short story because I could just write those faster. I write a lot of flash fiction. Um, so some of those are not even a thousand words. I'm just getting something out that I want to write. Um, and then that's what I want to do. But when I really want to dig in and have a journal and spend like years on characters and spend a lot of time, then it is a novel. I, that's why I like to do both. I feel so blessed to have both. So right now I have four books that have been published and two are short story collections and two are novels. And I feel really blessed in this business to be able to do both because I really do like them both. Although I like talking about novels more because most people really just don't get short stories and it's becomes really exhausting to try to explain short stories to people who don't get them. And it seems like everyone gets novels. So I'm, I would much rather talk about novels than short stories. What novels are you talking about by other writers now? Well, I don't read a lot of literary fiction when I'm working on books. I, I can't really. I've got Luster next to my bed. I've got um, another book by Bren Greenwood next to my bed. Um, I just got Black Buck and Honey Girl. And I get all these books, but if I'm writing, I don't want to read them. I can't read a lot of them because I'm afraid of too much. So I end up reading a lot of nonfiction about um, either people I love or flowers and birds. <laughs> oh, I might want to add Doug Tallamy's Nature's Nature's Best Way. I'm going to mess it up. Ooh. Okay. It's all, it's all about biodiversity and how if we do not care for birds, if we don't ensure their their food supplies, yeah, pollinators go, and as the birds go, so do we. And it, it is it does not portend well for us. Nature's okay, Best yeah. Hope. Oh, thank you, Claire. Claire is like thank great you from uh from mash all right another question oh wow this is kind of morbid lisa who is your favorite deceased author oh jane austen beautiful because yeah, yeah well because i'm a member of the jane austen society of north america and she's just my favorite she is my absolute favorite yeah so it's funny on goodreads you can put your influences and i just put jane austen not because i think like i write not because i think i write like jane austen but because um one time there was um uh, years ago, I saw a quote of hers that said, my characters will have some trouble, but in the end, everything they desire. And that's how I feel about my own work. I put them through a bit of trouble and we'll see, but I'm trying to take care of them the best that I can. And just her timelessness and her humor. And yeah, that's a really easy answer for me. Thank you for the question. I saw you got a quote in um, Harper's Bazaar highlighted this close to us okay as a book to read in 2021. And you were quoted as saying, I wanted to write a book about connection and how we as humans find ways to keep fighting for the light, 
even in the darkest dark. That's such a beautiful reminder. Okay, let's see. Um, why do you list your Myers-Briggs type in your biography? Do you use this personality type in your typing? Wait, do you use this personality typing in your writing? Personality type maybe in your writing? Yeah. Um, no, no, I don't. I list that. Yeah, that's a funny thing because it seemed like everyone kind of had that. Like everyone was like, oh, this is mine. This is mine. I never knew mine. I never knew what those letters meant. I didn't care. And it didn't mean anything to me until, I don't know, one day I was just bored and took it. And I really did learn. I thought my whole life I was extroverted and I learned that I was introverted. Like the reason I felt the way I felt was because I'm actually introverted. Although I seem very extroverted, I'm not because it's where you get your energy from. So yes, I can talk to people for an hour and I can go out and I've seen whatever, but then I have to go home and not see anyone for like a full week. And I didn't realize why I was like that. And so just in learning about myself, I, I just decided to start putting it in in all the stuff I had just because I thought it was interesting just about myself. I learned about myself probably, you know, it was probably about 10 years ago and I'm 42 now. So then I was like into my thirties and being like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. And so I just like learning about myself in that way. And then I like to tell people on my website, I tell them a lot because <laughs> I list a lot of stuff, but yeah, those are just like, if you were just like kind of getting a snapshot of me, that's why I always put like, I'm easily startled because it's a really big part of my personality that my husband has to be like, Hey, every time I like, if I'm downstairs in the laundry room, he has to be like, Psst. like he'll make a sound for me so that it doesn't scare me. It's a huge part of my personality. It's like the same way, like I'm really allergic to ragweed. Like it's a part of my personality. There are places I cannot go. Like then, you know, I have to take so many allergy pills a day. Like it's a part of my personality. So, so is, you know, INFJ. It is. But do you know the first time I read your website, first of all, for anybody who has not visited Lisa's website, check it out because it's so fun to see the way that you characterize yourself, the snapshot of you. And the thing that endeared me endeared you to me immediately was the fact that you startle easily <laughs> such a little detail but so important and along those same lines what has the pandemic taught you about yourself that you didn't know before or sheltering in place yeah well it's taught me that I can go a really 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 almost a scary long time without talking to a lot of people outside of my little family you know um I've tried my best to like check in on people and stuff but it, I can go a lot longer without you know face to face or even phone conversations than I than I thought I thought I could go a pretty long time but I didn't quite realize how long I could go so but it, you know it also really taught me how how, well, it's taught, it's teaching me how tough we all are, you know, you know, how resilient the human spirit is and how resilient people can be even when we, you know, a year ago when we just had no idea what was going to happen, you know, um, it's taught me how tough I am about some things because I didn't know how I would handle something like this. You know, I had no idea how I would handle it. And so it's, it's really amazing to turn around and see all the really beautiful positive things that have come out of people reaching out for each other helping each other the connections people have been able to make online and doing things like this and and how you know people really do want that connection so I definitely miss so many things and I hope it's over soon but I am surprised how much of a house cat I really am when it comes to like getting out in big crowds of course I mean I could never I don't care about going out in a big crowd but what I miss most of all of course is traveling you know, when I was learning to ski, and I'm a horrible skier, a friend of mine said to me, when you get to the bottom of the mountain, be sure to look back every time and acknowledge wow. that you just, that's so powerful. Yeah. And you were talking about what the pandemic has taught you. I would just like to remind anyone listening now, look back at the right. past 10, 11 months. Look at what you have done, how far you have come. And, 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 and. I don't know if appreciate is the right word, but, or pat yourself on the back, but just acknowledge that. All right, Lisa, Absolutely. there's a question here, the last thing. Can you go to your chat box and tell me, because Claire has labeled it possible spoilers. So I will let you decide whether or not you want to read that question aloud and respond to it. And if not, I had another question up here for you. I don't know if this will, let me see. Oh, okay. Let me read it. Okay. 
And do you mind spoilers? I heard Ruman Alam recently say about um, his novel, um, Leave the World Behind. I really don't care about spoilers. I don't either. And because I'm easily startled and because I can't stand the anxiety, I will sometimes, I, well, a lot of times spoil myself on purpose uh, <laughs> with something. I will, I will read, I will read all about a book or a movie before I even watch it. So let me see. She, um, let's see. Claudia is to the people who do not like spoilers because we don't want to ruin. Oh, book. definitely. So they're just asking how I decided to reveal things towards the end and whether I tried it different ways and if I considered having little bits along the way. Um, thank you for the question. It's a really good question. Yeah. So when, you know, so the, of course, you know, in writing the book, the secrets all come out in the end in different ways. I, um, yeah, no, I always knew I was going to hold that until the end. I always knew I had, like I said before, I had that stuff in my pocket and, and I really wanted, um, there's a point where Tally's like, you know, we can be sort of like a sealed, this, the weekend can be sort of like this sealed container and it can just sort of exist on its own. And so that's the reason I didn't allow a lot of flashback and a lot of stuff to come in. Cause I wanted the reader to almost forget why they're together, almost forget that there were these huge things going on and just sort of relax into the magic of Tally's home and the magic of this new relationship that had so much tenderness and sweetness and the way they're just listening to each other. So no, I held that back specifically and didn't really ever think about weaving it throughout. Um, you know, you also, you know, you want to, as a writer, you want to make sure you're not just like puking all this stuff up at the end either, but but I, I really liked the idea, almost in the same way that someone would write a thriller, uh, you know, or, you know, or a TV show or movie, you, you don't want to know what happens too, too soon. I want to, I want to keep going on. And then when everything starts to happen, you're like, oh, now it's getting kind of wild. And I wanted the reader to have that feeling like, okay, so I really, especially in the last third of the book, I feel like you're really like, okay, wait a minute, everything is happening all at once. And I, and I, wa I want the reader to be like flying through because I know I love that feeling when I'm reading a book. So I was definitely trying to recreate that. A small um, pleasure for me of the novel was knowing that Tally is the kind of woman, I think there are two kinds of people in the world, people who just go through their lone wolf and people, if you know them, you know their little sister, you know their favorite cousin, you know their big brother, you know their mother, you've met their mother's best friend and that right. is her. Why, why did you want to make her that way? Yeah, I just loved that being a part of her personality. I, I just love people like that. And I knew she had to be that kind of person or she never would have invited him at home anyway she is that kind of person to where you meet her yeah you you know hey we're going right over here to my parents you know anniversary party you want to come and I love people like that even though I would never because I'm so private and I'm like no that's just a family thing but I love people like that like I have a girlfriend who's so dear to me and I remember we hadn't been friends very long but she invited me to like go with her mom and sister and a very small like truck and to like travel from here to West Virginia. And it just was the sweetest thing that she would have been just fine with me, like hopping in there with her family on a family trip. And I just loved it. It says so much about her because she is such a sweet, kind, warm-hearted person who really would just love to have someone around for something like that. And so that's, I, I knew that Tally had to have that sort of personality. And then I also wanted to show how important Tally's family is to her. You know, it, you know, the first few pages, she starts talking about her brother. She's crazy about her big brother and he's crazy about her. And, you know, it's a huge part of her life, her, her little, her family that she's her friend and then also her family. And they're, they're super close, even though they drive each other completely mad sometimes, but cause that's what life is like that's what life is like. You have to just get on with it, forgive each other. And then let's try to make this as good as we can while we're still here. I heard you on Lois writes this this morning on city lights. In fact, I have my bat phone here. Lois has been texting me. Um, she says, Ray Bradbury wrote dandelion wine. Lisa is your dandelion puff. I didn't know that about Ray Bad Bradbury. Oh. You know my dandelion puff. And Lois says, love the observation about stormy atmosphere and interiority. And Lee Lois also loves your identification with Jane Austen's treatment 
of her characters beautiful. Oh, wow. And what yeah. I thought was beautiful about your conversation with Lois this morning was that she had you end with a reading, the last thing you want your readers to know. And I, I think it's important for us to share that again in case anyone listening now didn't hear it before. So would you read that for us as well? Absolutely. So yeah, I have an author's note at the end. It was, um, it was always the idea that I had. Um, I, I knew that if I was going to write a book where I have people contemplating whether or not to stay here, um, to stay on earth, I knew that I was going to address the reader directly at the end of the book because um, I want everyone to hang on tight and stay here and to know how loved they really are. So after you finish the book, it says, Dear Reader, I'm a firm believer in holding fast to good, lovely, beautiful things as much as I can in this world, even when things, even when times are hard. I want to comfort my characters when they are sad, depressed, or grieving. I love filling my books with coziness, warm drinks, and sweet conversations, even when I'm making my characters' worlds crumble around them. In life, I try my best to look for the light and to look for small mercies, even when things are dark and scary. It's important for me to leave this book on that, a hopeful note. If you're looking for a sign of hope, a sign of light, a sign to hold fast, please let this be it. New mornings mean new mercies. And if things do get too dark for you, please speak up and reach out for help. You're not alone. You matter. You are so loved. And then at the end, I sign off and have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, you know, in case anyone or anyone love would, would get there and, and need that for sure. Would you read that number for us? Oh, absolutely. Um, it is 1-800-273-8255. Okay, we're winding down. So I have two more questions for you unless someone in, in the chat room has a question. Give me three things people can do to self-soothe and to comfort. Something really, a quick hit, something that requires more thought and something that they can do to plant a seed today that may not grow for two, three, 10 years, but they will at least plant that seed today. I would say first off to just, be quiet or get to some quiet. And so that can look different for a lot of people. And it's hard, especially if you have little ones, but I mean, like away from a phone, away from social media, away from performing for anyone really, um, to get to a place where you can just be quiet. It's so important to me. I love the quiet and I need it. I really can't function without it. Another one would be to not wait to do something really special. So I'm a person who just loves to light candles every night, or, you know, I have my favorite tea every night. I have my favorite tea, three, four cups a day, um, things like that to not, to not wait. And it, it's not about things that cost money, but especially if someone's like, Oh, well, I only wear those earrings. If I'm going out, I only wear that lipstick if there's a special occasion, but if you love it, um, just love it. Let it, let, you know, let it, let it, lo <laughs> let yourself love it, you know? Um, and then the thing for the future, um, you know, I would, I would really I think what has changed my life is just being honest with myself and other people about what I want to do and the things that I don't like and saying no to things that don't bring me joy. Um, you know, all through college and my younger, you know, if someone was like, Hey, we're having this huge thing. And I would be like, Oh yeah, that sounds cool. When it did not sound cool at all. I just, you know, but at like, it's like 10, like I said, about 10 years ago, I really made a point if someone invited, I'd be like, Oh no, I don't really like that, but thank you. You know, I won't be coming to that. I'm not interested in that at all, but thank you for thinking of me. That's really sweet. And I can say no and have that be it. It really, those things really changed my everyday things and changed my, you know, my whole world. And I don't ever want to waste any time. I really don't. I, I don't know how long I have in this world. I do not, I'm not promised anything at all. And so I'm very, very careful to as best as I can not to waste any time. Uh, I'm gonna ask you a question now because I know the answer. Typically, I do not like when people ask an author, so what's next? As if writing a novel and being a homemaker were not a monumental enough achievement. <laughs> But I happen to know there's something spicy on the horizon for Lisa Crosspan Smiths. You want to tell us about it? <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. So my next book is coming out a year from now and it's called Half Blown Rose. It's about a woman named Vincent who, after her husband's betrayal, she moves to Paris to live in her parents' apartment. They're not there. And she teaches art there. She makes earrings. She teaches art. And in one of her art classes, she meets a young man who just so happens to be the same age as her son. He's in his 20s. And um, they start a really intense relationship. Um, and the story is just, it's very, it's, it's very Paris. I took a lot of French <laughs> in preparing and for my research to write the story. And we, you know, we went to Paris not too long ago. And so, yeah, I, I really, her name is Vincent after Van Gogh. And, and yeah, I'm really, really excited about this book. It's, it's different. It's different than the other stuff that I've written. And I love writing about women in their forties. And I, I just love writing about Paris and it's very romantic and I'm really excited about it. What's not to love about Paris? All right, I thought that was my last question, but then when you held up your darling little earring, I think there was one woman in the audience saying, where'd she get that earring? So what do you want to tell us about your earring? I did. I got these from Etsy. So if you go to Etsy and look for polymer clay earrings, that what I love, I love huge earrings, but you can't even remember that you have them in. So they're so light. It's like, you're not, you're not wearing anything. And so that I love them. So I, yeah, early on in quarantine, I bought a lot of polymer clay earrings. <laughs> well, Lisa, I love you. I thank you. I'm grateful that you keep putting pen to paper or fingers to keyboard <laughs> and rendering these beautiful characters and this beautiful light for us to bask in.